Morning. A few more of you back here, which I think that means good news. People are starting to feel better. Anyone uh, experience a little extra peace this last week? No, we're just all riddled with anxiety. Uh, <laughs> if you remember, I did preach on anxiety, canceling it out. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, God's word's amazing. And there's always opportunity to exercise what we learn uh, in it. Uh, grateful to be here. Uh, grateful to see you guys. Grateful for all those of you who are still joining us from live stream. Um, uh, sorry if that's out of necessity, uh, but I'm so grateful for the time in which we live, uh, the age in with we, which we live, uh, the technology that we have. Uh, that affords us so much, even though that technology we have also seems to cause a lot of prob- more problems um, or accentuate the problems we already had. Um, we are here, we're going to continue in our uh, passage here in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Um, I'm actually going to spend one more week this week on the passage we were on last week. I thought there was just too much there, um, and I wanted to give us something Um, because this statement that Jesus makes, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This song that we just sang that for some of you brought back fond memories, uh, maybe instilled some peace in your soul because it's true, right? We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We order our life rightly. Everything that we are striving for just ends up coming because the one thing we truly need, we are after and we are receiving, um, and so I wanted to give us something that is practical in nature, uh, more how do I actually seek the kingdom of God? Um, what does that actually look like in my life? Because uh, oftentimes you can preach to a passage and you get to the application point and then it's, you know, stomach start growling and it's time to go home. And they're just like, okay, well, cool. I understand that. Got to seek first in the kingdom. But how does that, how does that work out? Um, and so thinking about this passage, looking at it, um, I've boiled down, just want to give you a broad overview of where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to, p- I picked out three ways in which to do this, which, um, I will say seeking first the kingdom is like, you just throw a dart at the dartboard. There's many ways in which we could do that. Um, it is, it is with our time, with our talents, with our treasures. Some of you have heard that three, those three T's alliterated uh, in sermons. I would also add our temperament. Uh, the way in which we do things, all of those uh, describe how we are or, or, or indicate how we are seeking the kingdom and our ways in which we can seek the kingdom. Uh, but I want to give us three practices that would help us in this. But before I get there, I want to get back into the passage, establish a few things um, just so we're on the same page, and then we're going to move forward into those, those three ways. So sound like a good deal? Good. Uh, Because if it's not, it's still happening. So, uh, uh, but we are we are here, right? Because we are to seek first the kingdom. That statement encompasses our our mission statement as a church, our desire as a local body of believers to develop devoted disciples, or to help people to grow to maturity in what they believe and how they live. Same thing. Um, it, it, it encompasses a place where faith and fellowship create a family. Um, it encompasses everything that we do. It encompasses Jesus' command to go and make disciples. And it's really been his desire for us for all of eternity. Right? We were created by God for God. We were created to enjoy him, to follow him, to, to fellowship with him, to fill the, the earth with his image. Um, and all that got broken. But it, that desire and that design never really changed. Like even in like Isaiah, like in Isaiah 26, 8, in, your, in the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait. For your name and renem- remembrance are the desire of our soul. Or as the uh, NIV says, your name and your renown are the desire of our soul. Your kingdom, you being known, is what fully fulfills us. And so as such, when we establish this as our, as our, our method of which we, we live, it, it brings us joy. When we begin to live for Jesus first, when we, when we make him our focus, our focal point in life, as I, as I described it last week, 
it starts taking out that anxiety that is in me, the division of my soul, the chaos that's around me, and brings peace. And as we looked at this passage before, um, we, we noticed in the beginning that, that anxiety and faith do not coexist. Now, I'm not talking about a, a mental or a, a physical abnormality of a brain that's causing your body to do chemically things. I'm talking about general worry in our life. Like, oh no, did I turn off the, 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 the stove before I went to bed? Or did I lock all the doors? Or am I going to forget my, you know, what I've memorized for my exam? Um, I mean, worry, worry happens all the time around finals. Um, and I'm so glad I'm not in school right now. I just get to study and, and enjoy it uh, rather than being burdened by deadlines. And Well, I have some deadlines. There's a Sunday every week. so. Um. <laughs> but Jesus says this, and let's, I mean, if you have your Bibles open, let's look at chapter uh, 6. We're going to start in verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and neither toil nor spin. And I tell you, and I tell you, that even Solomon, in all of his glory... All of his glory never had Patagonia. Oh, sorry, that's not what this says. Um, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive, today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not more, much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Notice that, little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, and what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That therefore, for that statement that we just sung together twice, comes out of the statement that Jesus just made, you of little faith. It's little faith that causes us not to seek the kingdom. Right? And what Jesus is essentially arguing here is that the believer is not to be controlled by or influenced by the world in any way. Like All that the world has for us or doesn't have for us is not to influence our personhood, our spirit, our soul, our mental state, any of that. We are to live in complete and full trust in God. But what it also shows is that seeking first the kingdom, this is going to be my first point here, means that we live our lives with deep faith in the person and promises of God. It necessarily means that we live our lives in deep faith in the persons and promises of God. And I don't think I need to belabor this point, but I just want to get it out there so it's just established. Um, Seeking first the kingdom of God and this may be obvious, means not seeking my kingdom. You know, we're all born seeking our own kingdom. Starts in, in infancy. Um, it continues. Uh, it's so it's seeing, you really start seeing it when you're around two or three. Um, and it just continues and continues and continues. And life is about me, my needs, my wants, my desires, how I feel, what I want, what I want, I want it now. Right? And seeking first the kingdom of God means not seeking that. Prioritizing God and his person and his promises first over my desires. And actually, we could really get into a theological underpinnings of all this and say that that's, this is a work of the Spirit in me who changes my desires from myself to the things of God. That if I am a believer in Jesus, he is changing what I, what I desire, changing what I need, changing what I go after, and making me to want him. But there's a growth in that. There's a process of faith. Um, right? So seeking first the kingdom is not seeking myself. It is not seeking the kingdom 
of America. That should be, right? I don't think I need to belabor that. We are not seeking the kingdom of our political party. We are not ambassadors for a Democrat or Republican. We are not ambassadors for this nation. We are ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven. Our citizenship is in another place that is here in part, but not here fully. Now, does that mean that we don't become good citizens as we're there? Absolutely it does. We should be the best citizens. This is Sanctity of Life Sunday. We believe that the Bible teaches that all life is precious and valuable. Why? Because it is all created in the image of God. It has intrinsic value and worth because it is created in the image of God. And it begins at conception. And we live in a country right now where it is more of a fine, uh, more, there's more consequence to having in your possession an eagle feather than it is to dismember a living human being in utero. You guys realize this? You're walking in the woods, and we're getting more eagles around, right? They drop feathers, what birds do. You pick one up, better hope that's a turkey feather, because you hold that, you are liable up to $100,000 in fines and a year in prison. And billions of dollars have been spent on trying to make it accessible and easy for people to kill a child. Now, that should tell you something is off, right? And this is why we we are able to vote. It's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to be in this country. We can meet. We can speak freely for the most part. Um, And this this is a blessing. But this is not our home. Our kingdom is from somewhere else. It exists in us. It exists as us as a church. The church is to be a, an example of what the kingdom of God is. Um, it is a, to be a taste. Um, a, 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 yeah, I guess an example. That's a word. Uh, we are supposed to taste and see how, the, how life is in the kingdom of God. So I Paul, all, all these one another's that are in the Bible. Love one another, forgive one another, be patient with one another, be kind with one another, serve one another, be tenderhearted. Like all those things are supposed to happen within the context of this family. So that the world who sees that not happening anywhere else looks in and sees this happening here in a deep and abiding way and says, that's what life was made for. Not disunity and disharmony, but unity. So we we seek first the kingdom, his kingdom, not my kingdom, not the country I live in, not the the political affiliations that I'm in, although those can be outreaches of my seeking the kingdom, but I have to have the priorities right first. I have to understand that I am a Christian first. I am a, actually before that, I am a son or a daughter of the king. of, Of the king of the universe. God, Heavenly Father. That's, and that's really what this, most of this sermon is about. You are beloved by your Father in heaven. You are seen by your Father in heaven. You are cared for by your Father in heaven. Now as such, these things should be seen in your life. So that, with that being said, the second point is this, that God calls His people to exercise and increase their faith. God calls his people to exercise and increase their faith. Look at this passage here. I'm just going to stay right here, and then I'm going to branch out into other passages. Because I think I, you, some of you may have questions on this statement. I'm trying to anticipate those a little bit. And, I'm, and if you have any more, come talk to me. But Jesus here in this passage, what is he saying before, O oh, you of little faith? What does he ask his people to do? This is not a rhetorical question. What does he ask his people to do? Consider. Look. Look at the birds of the field. 
Look at flowers. Look at creation. Look around you. Let that speak to you and inform you about our, your God. Let that, if I start trusting the more God more about that, what, is that, what does that result? An increasing of my faith. What is Jesus necessarily saying when he says, Oh, you of little faith, don't be like the Gentiles, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He's suggesting, don't be like a person of little faith, be like a person with great faith and seek God. Right? Our faith is increased by what we look and see. Faith is not an illogical, mystical thing that just comes down when you're sitting on your recliner. It is a gift. It is absolutely a gift. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and it is a gift of God. It is a gift for every believer. It is a working of the Spirit in us, in God's sovereign election of who we are into His kingdom. It is a gift. There are gifts of faith where certain people had just seemed to have a gift of faith. Right? Man, that, that person just believes. Nothing brings them down. And there's certain people who have that. There's certain people who have a gift of, of service, who have a gift of mercy, who have a gift of preaching and teaching. And they're all supposed to be used for the body. But there is a general gift of faith given to all of us. And because we don't have a specific gift of faith does not mean we're not called to exercise the faith that we have. All right? It begins with hearing of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. Um, it's a gift of the Spirit, like I said. But our gifts are things that we are called to steward and increase. So Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Which is a gift of his eldership, his leadership, his teaching, his preaching. But the concept remains the same. Timothy, for whatever gift Paul is singling out, that Timothy knows about, is called to fan into flame. And what, what is that? I mean, what's that image? You got some coals, right? Who are going out, and you fan them. You get more oxygen in there, and they spark up. They increase. And I think is exactly what Jesus is talking about here, where he says, "Oh, you of little faith, consider and increase your faith. Expand your trust in your good and gracious Father." Trust Him. And it's an action. Now, this is not... Um, this is not contrary to what Pastor Steve was preaching. We are helpless before God. We cannot save ourselves. It is all based on Him. I, am, I have no righteousness in myself. Andrew Hebel is not righteous. The chosen, redeemed Son of God... In me is righteous. Jesus Christ is righteous. I am righteous because of Him. The old Andrew, dead and gone. The new Andrew, fully redeemed in Christ. Already, but not yet. That's all true. But at the same time, Paul writes in Philippians um, chapter 2, Therefore, my beloved, you have, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you to both will and work for his good pleasure. Does, does Paul say, Now, therefore, my beloved brethren, relax, kick back, wait for the Lord to work out his good will in you? No. Trust God and get going. God's working in you. He's not going to leave you. He's shaping you. He's changing you. 
He wants to partner with you. And this is a message I think that this, our, our day and age, we really need. Because God is not some cosmic abuser. Come on. He doesn't force His way on us when we don't want Him. He gently works in us. He disciplines us. Yes. He shapes us through that. Yes. But He doesn't take us like a robot and move us around. He guides us, He leads us, and He wants us to partner with Him. So we are called to exercise our faith. That's a choice. Every single day we have that choice. Lord, we have a choice to be anxious about things or not. Lord, I was exposed to COVID. And I can have a choice to go, oh no, I'm... It's a death sentence. I'm going to die. I can't do anything. Everything's going to fall apart. Blah, and just whatever your mind, wherever your mind wants to go with that, you have that choice. Or you have a choice to say, you know what? Fine. I may get it. I may not. I'll take some necessary precautions. I'll take some tests. I'll find out. At the end of the day, God is either going to keep me here or he's not. I'm fine. I can choose to worry about my kids when they get on the bus. What's going to happen to them? They're going to a school. I don't know what's going to be taught to them. I know what, you know what they're going to be exposed to. Or I can just trust the Lord with them and train them. I can be anxious about, I'm, going to, not, I'm, I'm not a good parent. I'm not going to do, do a good job. I'm going to mess these kids up, blah, blah, blah. Or I can just trust the Lord and seek Him and understand that there's grace and there's mercy and He works through everything in our life. So it's all good. As long as I'm humble and I'm trusting Him and I'm seeking Him. Does that make sense? Okay, because of that, these two truths, I want to get into this practical way in which we follow the Lord. And one of the ways throughout history um, of the church, people have practiced their faith through these things called spiritual disciplines. You guys ever heard of these things? I don't know where you grew up. I mean, I'm grateful, Dan, for you talking about the different backgrounds people are in. Because I grew up in a, a church under a family who had, had grown up in a very legalistic church. Do, don't, you know, don't, you know, what's the, what's the saying? Don't uh, drink or chew or go, don't drink or chew or go with girls or do, you know. You can't dance. Dancing is of the devil. Um, you know, drums. Whew. We don't need that demonic rhythm in our <laughs> congregations. Um, everyone has to be uptight when you come in here. And then we don't talk about what we do, you know. And there's one, you know, one difference about between the Baptists and the Presbyterians. Is they don't talk to each other in the liquor store, you know. <laughs> so, and it's, it's just this, all these rules and regulations that just constrict people with, out of good intentions... Right? We want people to live in a, in a blessed life, following the Lord, not being a victim to the consequences of sin. But if it's done in the wrong way, it ends up doing exactly the opposite of what we want it to do. And it causes rebellion. And so I, I came up out of that. So I'm in the churches that are like, anything that deals with rules, um, that is Pharisee. Uh, nope. Pharisee. Pharisee. Don't tell me to do that. You're not going to tell me what to do. I have freedom in Christ. I can do whatever I want. And, and you miss some of these things that are extremely helpful for centering our life on Jesus. Because the spiritual dis- disciplines, they're actions that aid us in our desire to know, trust, and follow the Lord. Know, trust, and follow the Lord. Those three statements actually could just be an outline for this sermon that we're in. Know, trust, follow. Know, trust, follow. They're they're actions. Spiritual disciplines, habits of grace, maybe you've heard them. Methods of maturity. I'm not sure if someone else said that, but maybe I came up with it so you can... Quote me or something. I don't know. 
Whatever they are, they are ways in which, if they're approached the right way, can aid us. They are not guarantees. A plus B equals this. But they are helps to say, Lord, I want to know you deeper. I am submitting myself under this thing in the attempts to know and depend on you and walk with you more closely. So there's lots of these things. Probably 10, 12, depending on what you've you looked through in history. And I told you three. Guys, I'm, not, I'm only going to do three. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, maybe it would be good at some point to do a series on the spiritual disciplines. Maybe it would be good to, as a church, practice these things once a month or something. Here, let's throw a new one in. Let's just try it together and talk about each other, how, how, whatever, what our experience has been about this. But the first... Um, Actually, before I get in the first one, I just want to, again, highlight this is, this is just us placing ourselves in the position to receive from the Lord, right? So Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord passed by and said, you're supposed to say that loud. Um, what did Zacchaeus do? He didn't stay in his house. He didn't hide behind the crowd or under the crowd. He got up to position himself to where Jesus could see him. And as he did, come down here, Zacchaeus. I want to talk to you. Or like Blind and Bartimaeus, which is probably one of my favorite characters in Mark. This guy just sitting on the side of the road. Complete juxtaposition between the disciples and... And this guy, and I'm just going to stop there because I'm going to get on another sermon. But he positioned himself in the way of Jesus. Said he was sitting along the side of the way Jesus was going. And he calls out, Son of David, have mercy on me. I can't see. I don't even know if he's right there. I just hear some people, Son of David, have mercy on me. And his disciples, the disciples are like, hush, dude. He doesn't want to talk to you. And Jesus is like, bring that guy up here. What do you want? I, I want to see. There you go. You can see. And he follows Jesus along the way. And these type of things, I think, in, with, with the right perspective and the right position, do the exact same thing for us. So with that being said, the first uh, spiritual discipline I want to look at is silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. And this is my statement on this uh, because I felt like I needed to have something on PowerPoint. Um, But silence and solitude, it prioritizes our relationship with Jesus over the noise and needs of the day. Silence and solitude positions our relationship with Jesus over the noise and the needs of the day. Um, Just doing a quick survey. I mean, we we are just so distracted and it's a good thing I don't, you guys are shaking your head, so I don't need to explain this very much. <laughs> but 77% of adults say that when they have nothing to do or they're bored, they check their phone. And maybe that's a low number. But there's not a, little, a whole lot of space anymore in our lives where we can just sit and be with ourselves. We've surrounded ourselves with so much technology that is just constantly in us. And around us. And we will look at the life of Jesus, the man who came, who carried the greatest burden that anyone would ever carry, who had the most difficult job description in all of history. He made sure that he spent time alone in solitude and silence. Right, so right in, I mean, Mark chapter or Matthew chapter 3 you could turn there if you want 16 and 17 so when Jesus was baptized he immediately went up from the water and behold the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him and behold a voice from the heavens said this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased which by the way this is almost a starting point for every believer we're baptized into the family. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter with whom I'm well pleased. 
And from there we go with our Lord. But what happens immediately after? He's led to a desolate place. He's led into the wilderness to be eventually tempted by the devil. But it's 40 days in a place of desolation, a place of silence, a place of solitude. Which is not necessarily the place of weakness. It's the place where he's receiving and communing with God and praying and being in, in, in relationship with him, preparing for the temptation that was about to come to him. And I think that that's really the point of the story, that you need time with the Lord in order to up, stand up underneath the schemes of the devil. You need relationship with him, prioritize with him, or you're going to be taken over by the enemy. And you look through his whole life, his whole life, you look through, I mean, all over the place. Mark 1, 35, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And after he sends out the 12 disciples, right, he goes, they, they all go out, they preach, they heal people, they cast out demons, they do all this work, and then he brings them back. The first thing that he does, Mark six thirty one, he says to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Stop the noise, get away, spend some time in prayer, and rest. The God of the universe needed to spend time with, his, with the Heavenly Father. And how often do we miss that? ourselves. I'm not trying to guilt trip anyone, but I just know people. And I've, I've been a pastor for a while. Every year I give these things out. Seen these things? Read a through the Bible in a year. It takes like 15 minutes to read the daily reading. It's a fraction of the people who actually get through that. I know myself. I'm a pastor. And sometimes I get too busy. I got to jump up, go to run, do all these things. It is, it is a battle to get away from the noise. But it's extremely necessary for your spiritual life. Any of you read the screw tape letters? Yeah. Those demons called their kingdom a kingdom of noise. Uh, that's at least how C.S. Lewis described it. Chaos and noise, just commotion, always going around. That's the end goal, to get everything just kind of going, 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 and wear people out. But God calls us into silence and solitude, which is not withdrawal, it's not isolation, it's relationship with God for purpose. Silence is both internal it's external. All right, so external is the news, people, friends, appointments, all these different things going on. Internal silence. You ever just turned everything off and sat there? What goes on in your brain? Well, I got this going off, I got this thing. Oh, I wonder, you know what? I wonder how I can make uh, you know, a router sled to plane down a piece of wood, you know, like, I'm just going to Google that real quick. Right? I just, your brain goes all over the place. And it is work to quiet those things down, to get before the Lord, and to receive from Him. It's a place where we find safety. It's a place we are filled. It's the place where we find rest. And oftentimes this has been called a quiet time. So did this preacher just tell me that I need to have a quiet time? Yes, I did. But even more than that, I would challenge some of you, and some of you are just, this is not possible. You've got young kids, you've got biz schedules that are all over the place. You can't get away for a day. But some of you can. And our church needs you to. Get away. Stop. Pause. Turn everything off. And spend time in the Word, 
and in prayer for just a day and see what the Lord will do in you and as a result in us as a church. Someone was, once said that without solitude, it's virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and to listen to him. And I think it's true. So science and solitude prioritizes our relationship with Jesus over the noise and the needs of the day. Second, Sabbath prioritizes our need for rest and dependence on God's provision over the limitlessness of our desire. Over the limitlessness of our desire. This is not, um, I don't think this is kind of new because this has been from the beginning. God called his people to rest. God rested in the, in the, on the seventh day. Uh, God commanded his people to rest. Why did he have to command his people to rest? Because we're crazy. <laughs> and we won't do it. I, I understand. I, I have a lot of things to do. It is hard for me to sit down and to rest. Just to sit still. To forget all of the different things that need to happen and just stop. Why? Because they need to happen. I mean, pastors are some of the most, the biggest uh, violators of this out of all. Because we're needed by our congregation. And our congregation needs us. What if someone got sick? What if someone, I need to get a hold of my pastor. What if something fell down? What if, some, what, what if something's going to mess up? There's always an email. There's always a text. There's always a call. And you just take that and you insert it into any area of life and you can make the same argument. See, our desire, the problem is that our desire is infinite. What we want never gets fulfilled. It's actually not even a bad thing because, uh, as Dallas Willard said, a desire is infinite but partly because we are made by God, made for God, made to need God, and made to run on God. We can be satisfied only by the one who is infinite, eternal, and able to supply all our needs. We are at home in God. When we fall away from God, the desire for the infinite remains, but is displaced upon the things that certainly lead to destruction. Another person said, infinite desire minus finite being equals a chaotic spiritual life. It's deeply difficult to rest and we are tr- we, because we are wired to try to work out things on our own. But our loving Heavenly Father, I mean, not even, there's not a command in the New Testament. right? This is why I'm still calling it a spiritual discipline. There's a command for the people of God. I think we can learn from that and say, okay, that's really good for me. Maybe I can adopt that and put it on. Um, I mean, this week, I took a day. I turned my phone off at night. And I did not turn it on until the next evening. That was difficult. Not even because I had work-related things. I wanted to search something. I wanted to look at something. I'm a researcher. I wanted to research this thing. And it wasn't until like mid-afternoon that all of a sudden, like my wife can attest to this, was just finally ah, rested. It was good. The next day was productive. God gives that to us as a benefit. And we so often just toss it aside. Like, who are you to tell me to do something? Rest! Rest! Just lay down. Stop. The world's going to continue going on. I am God. I will take care of everything that you need. I will make the stuff be put together. And I can't tell you how many times that I had a, had a seminary work to do. I mean, I worked full-time. I had full-time school. And I had two little kids all at the same time. And I'm looking at it going, this is not going to work, Lord. Um, I'm, I need to graduate, and I know that there are grades that need to happen for that to do, and I know that there's stuff that needs to get done, and there's time that this needs to happen, and it's just not going to work. Because Hebrew, yep, not sticking in my brain, so I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to pass these exams. And I go through, and I, B, okay, that, I think that was turned around, that should have been at least a D or something, maybe an F, and no, the Lord provided 
And it's not from my own ingenuity. That's just Him providing what I needed at the time. And it's true with everything. Nothing absolutely depends on me. Nothing absolutely needs me. And I'm saying in a collective me, all of us. God calls and asks us to take a rest, and it's a benefit for your soul if you go along with it. The priority is our need for rest and dependence on God. So the first one helps us with our relationship. The second one helps us with our dependence on Him. And this third one... Um, actually, before I go on to this next one, I just want to say, as a, just as a, as a... If you're writing something down, and I know we're going to go a little long today, and again, get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Um, <laughs> we... We, one just principle for a Sabbath is just to do, just to filter everything that you do that day under this lens. Is it rest and worship? Is it restful and worshipful? This doesn't mean just sit around and not do anything. Golf is restful to some people. Golf is worshipful for some people. Am I neglecting my family in this, in the rest and the worship? Right? I can I can do things that bring rest, but you have to decide what that is. You know, fixing your gutter is probably not what it is. <laughs> Mowing the lawn, that's not rest. Well, maybe it is for some. I don't know. But whatever is restful and worshipful that's calling me to focus on the Lord more and receive from Him is what I should filter what I do on a day that I set aside to rest. Okay, now last one, and we're going to get through this. Um, simplicity positions our lives to be free um, from, I missed a word there, from the dependence on God's provision over the limit. Oh, I didn't change that. Simplicity frees our lives to be free from dependence on things of this world and makes us more available to bless others. Simplicity frees our lives to be free from dependence on the things of this world and makes us more available to bless others. This word, simplicity, frugality is the real actual ancient term um, to be frugal. But it's got some negative connotations these days. Um, so simplicity or minimalism is the big thing everyone's talking about, right? Minimize your life. It's huge in the secular world right now. And it's huge because people are reaping benefits from it right now because people are, are over inundated with stuff. And getting rid of it is cathartic for the soul. It comes out of a good place that is God designed and only re reaps its true benefit when it's acted upon by a believer in Jesus. We are not made to just amass a bunch of bunch and bunch of bunch of stuff. But we do. And I can go on and on about how wealthy we are, even though we, th we think we're really poor. We may be in bad positions. But it's, I mean, I, last week, I think I said $25,000. This is in 2014, a study done. $25,000 meant you were in the top 10% of the world's population. $34,000, this is crazy, means that you're in the top 1%. At $34,000 a year. A year. Now, we can look at our lives. We can look at every, everything's around. I mean, you, if you have young kids, you know stuff just comes in. It just happens. I mean, the toys, they uh, are fruitful and multiply at night. I don't know <laughs> what it is. But there's just, a, you just a mass stuff. And most of it is just needless. And we hold on to these things, you know. I got, I'm sure I have tons of shirts in my closet that have not been put on in years, but they just sit there because, you know what, maybe I'll have a painting project sometime. And, and you could just get rid of those things. And it frees you from the responsibility from all these different things and actually becomes a way in which God feeds the birds of the air. My stuff given to someone who's in deep need, who need, doesn't have what I have, and, but I have something that he could benefit him. So here you go. Have it. And then as such, I'm being freed from dependence on the things of this world. I'm being freed from a desire for material things and wealth. And I'm 
finding the benefit of living a generous life. Finding my full dependence and value in God. This passage is really dealing with those dichotomies. Serving God, serving stuff. And I think if I'm going to speak on any type of spiritual discipline, it's this. And Jesus modeled this. You know that Jesus, this is news maybe to some of you guys, he was not poor. Maybe his parents were poor when they had, gave him birth. But he grew in a middle class lifestyle. We know this from a couple of things. One, his family was invited to a wedding in Cana. I don't have the time to go through the, the archaeology and the, his, 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 the history. History histiology was the word I was going to say, but that's not right. Um, but Cana was a place where wealthy people were. And the, and the wedding which, which they were in it was going for a while. That came from someone who had means. Who's inviting friends in their same social status to them. Jesus in his ministry was well funded and provided for by rich women. Do you guys know this? Luke 8. Soon afterward, he went through the cities and villages proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdala, from whom seven demons count out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. He had so much, so much that he needed someone to manage the accounts who did a pretty poor job about it. He had a, a garment that people cast lots over because it was so nice. It was woven without a seam. But he didn't live in extravagance. And when he told his people to go minister, what did he tell them to do? Don't take two tunics. Don't bring extra sandals. Just bring what's on your feet, on your body, and go and trust the Lord to provide. Now, is he saying don't have stuff or don't have houses or don't have a beach house or a mountain home or land that you can go hunt? No, he's not saying any of that. He's just saying don't find your value in those things and don't be attached to them. And if so necessary, remove yourself from them. Get rid of them. Live on a budget. And if I do that, I will be amazed at how much I have left over. And amazed at what I can do to help someone else and steward my money to be a blessing to the kingdom. And I'm not saying we need more money here. We, maybe we, we do. We have debt. We have things to pay off. We can use steward that. But I'm saying that you have an opportunity with your budget to bless other people in places that do not know the Lord or who know him and desperately need his provision. And you could be the means and the pipeline through which God blesses someone else. And that is a blessing that is greater than the reception, reception of a gift. And living a simple life, paring down my things, my needs, helps to that. So, before we go into 4 o'clock this afternoon... Simplicity promotes contentment. And that's really where we need to get to. Contentment is a result of faith, but it promotes it. So what does Paul say when he, of this famous, famous saying we all know about in Philippians, I can do all things who, Christ who strengthens me. Do you guys know the context of that verse? No, I'll tell you. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can be content in any situation that God puts me in. Because Christ upholds me. 
And I have an opportunity every day to position myself like blind Bartimaeus or that wee little man named Zacchaeus. So with all that say, said, I'm not telling you to do all these things. I just, I've given you something. Here's a way. And, I, and I, I feel like I could explain this in a better way. Um, but this is what we have. Silence and solitude. Have a quiet time. Spend some time in just silence. Turn off the phone. Make a commitment not to check your phone before you spend time with the Lord. Just that one thing. See what it does for your week. I wake up in the morning. I'm not checking Facebook. I'm not checking Instagram or whatever social media is out there. I just, I'm going to leave it off. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Make a commitment to not to take a day just to rest and to worship. Don't answer emails. Don't do work. Just rest and worship. Make a commitment to look over your life and see what I need and what I don't need. What I can do without for the glory of God through prayer and trusting Him. So, how am I going to seek first the kingdom of God? It's a question I want you to ask yourself. I'm going to ask myself. And hopefully we can see God do amazing things through this church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You are good. You are gracious. You are kind. You are loving. You care. You shape. You mold. You walk with us. Whether we're an infant, we're 95 years in the faith. You are with us. Lord, we ask that you continue to conform us into the image of your Son. That you convict us, Lord, by your Spirit, that you would not condemn us or let us hear the words of condemnation that come from the enemy, that you would convict us in the way in which we should go. That we'd find healing, we'd find strength, and we'd find maturity in what it means to walk with you. In Jesus' name.